Hello, welcome to Monday's ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines in the southeast. Never again, the health secretary announces a public inquiry into the shocking hospital mortuary crimes of double killer David Fuller. We have a duty to look at what happened in detail and make sure it never happens again. This cancer has melted away with chemotherapy, OK? <laughs> it's OK. The moment a mother taking part in a new breast cancer trial is told her tumour has gone. Also tonight, as world leaders meet to tackle the climate crisis, how southeast entrepreneurs are doing their bit. And a remembrance journey. A grandson lays a wreath to the soldier killed saving his grandfather on the Western Front. Good evening to you. The Health Secretary has announced an independent national inquiry into the shocking crimes of David Fuller, who abused 100 female corpses at two Kent hospitals over 12 years, undetected. He filmed his crimes in recordings discovered by police after he was arrested for the historic murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pearce in Tunbridge Wells. Well, Tony Green is live for us this evening at Tunbridge Wells Hospital, where Fuller worked as an electrician. Tony, this inquiry had been called for by MPs across Kent. Yes, that's right, Fred. And that pressure had really stemmed from the harrowing detail that came out at Maidstone Crown Court last week during David Fuller's trial, where on Thursday he finally admitted to murdering Caroline Pierce and Wendy Nail back in 1987, two young women in their 20s that became known as the Bedsit Murders. Now, it was DNA evidence that led police to David Fuller's Heathfield home, but while they searched that home, they found more evidence, video recordings of crimes committed here at Tunbridge Wells Hospital in Pembury and at the Kent and Sussex Hospital, its predecessor. Fuller worked here as an electrician and he used his security pass to gain access to the mortuary where he abused the bodies of women and girls. Kent police have evidence of a hundred victims, 81 of which have been identified. Some may never be identified. That led calls for a public inquiry. Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells Trust had announced their own inquiry to begin with, but today the Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, announced a much broader public inquiry to look at what happened here, but also to look at security arrangements across all hospitals. And that's something that's been welcomed today in turn by the Tunbridge Wells MP, Greg Clark. Given the scale and the nature of these sexual offences, I believe that we must go further. And so today I can announce that I am replacing the trust investigation with an independent inquiry. The inquiry, the inquiry will look into the circumstances surrounding the offences committed at the hospital and their national implications. It will help us understand how these offences took place without detection in the trust, identify any areas where early action why this trust was necessary, and then consider wider national issues, including for the NHS. Their identities are known, and so that means that their families have been informed. And the shock and the desolation that these families are going through is beyond imagination. And that's why this inquiry is so important, because it can never be allowed to happen again. But, Tony, that's not the only issue that has emerged from this case. No, that's right. As David Fuller hasn't been sentenced for any of his crimes yet, but as the law currently stands, the maximum penalty for each of the offences he carried out here is two years in prison. MPs are, of course, lawmakers. And so today, Mr Javid announced that that too will be under review. As sentencing has yet to take place, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the particular case. But I will say this, that in light of what has happened, the Justice Secretary will be looking at whether the penalties that are currently available for such appalling sexual offences are appropriate. Now, an interim report is expected sometime in the new year, and then a full report expected much later in 2022. And the Health Secretary today promised MPs and the country that both of those reports would be published in full. Tony Green in Tunbridge Wells, thank you very much.
Well, if you are concerned that you or anyone you know may have been affected by this case, you can go to the Op Sandpiper Major Incident website at mip.police.uk. That's mipp.police.uk. Or phone this number 0800 051 5270. More of the day's other news now, and there are calls for the current nuclear power station site at Dungeness in Kent to host a new generation of smaller reactors. The site recently entered its defuelling phase, the step before it's decommissioned. Damon Collins, the MP for Folkestone and Hyde, says a consortium led by Rolls-Royce is looking for sites for its first three reactors, and Dungeness is ideal due to its size and existing connections to the national grid. A former professor at the University of Sussex says she stepped down from her role as the harassment she faced over her views on gender identity was too much. Kathleen Stock faced backlash from some students and staff who accused her of transphobia. The university described her exit as a loss and said it has vigorously defended her right to exercise her academic freedom and lawful freedom of speech. Kathleen said the university didn't feel like home anymore. She spoke exclusively to ITV's Lorraine programme this morning. The way I've always taught is I've always said to my students, I would like you to disagree with right. me. Okay. And I certainly don't want you to agree with me just because I said it. Mm. And I'll give them readings that are, you know, a range of different views, sometimes very strongly against one another. And that's what, as far as I'm concerned, what a university should be like. But yeah. I think there are some people now in universities who don't feel like that. So... No, it's a cancer that affects 1,700 people across Kent each year and more than 500 in East Sussex. But now trials of a new drug treatment are proving a success in curing the most aggressive form of breast cancer. Well, the emotional moment a mother was told her tumour had disappeared is at the heart of a new cancer research advert from today. Marianne Ford agreed to be filmed in the hope of giving encouragement to others, as Mary Stanley now reports. Recovering at home with her sister after an operation last week, another milestone in Marianne Ford's cancer journey. She was diagnosed with one of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer in March this year after discovering a lump. What was your reaction when they told you what it was? I just broke down, really. I was on my own, um, but they allowed me to bring my husband up with me um, after I'd got the news. Um, yeah, my instant reaction is, how long have I got? But Marianne was offered a clinical trial aimed at finding new treatments for patients with triple negative breast cancer. She was given an intense course of new chemotherapy drugs for three months. The emotional moment she discovered the result is now featuring in a cancer research campaign. The first time we met, but one of the things I said is that we want cancers to melt away. What well, you can see here, this cancer has melted away with chemotherapy. Okay? <laughs> so that's good news. Well, it's two of us will get cancer in our lifetime, but all of us can help beat it. After my first round of chemo, it reduced from five centimetres to one and a half. So within three weeks, it was, I could feel it physically myself. And after the second round, I couldn't feel it anymore. But then to have the MRI and then get the confirmation, actually, it's done its job. It's, um, yeah, absolutely amazing. Pretty much all the cancers shrink and up to 50% completely melt away. But in my view, every patient with cancer should be on a clinical trial because that is exactly how we improve cure rates and survival rates. We cure cancer most days, but that's not good enough. We need to cure cancer every day. Cancer centres like this one in Kent hope the trial will lead to new treatments. We've got so many youngsters with the triple negative and uh, oh my goodness it, I can't I just cannot put it into words what it will mean. Marianne needed surgery to remove breast tissue but the success of her treatment avoided a mastectomy. She wants to inspire others to play a part. If we can help a future generation it's amazing and my children the future generation. Just a few years ago the, the numbers that they were able to cure to what they do now that's quite dramatic still, and you can only get better going forward. Mary Stanley, ITV News. And we wish Marion and her family all the best. Very Absolutely. brave lady. 
Now, at one time, bookshops could be found on almost every high street, but they've had to face quite a few challenges, competing with online shopping and the arrival of e-readers. Well, it's no wonder then that this had been dwindling a bit until now, because as a bit of a bookworm myself, I'm <laughs> delighted to say bookshops appear to be booming once again, with more opening up and rising sales as well. Lauren Hall can tell us more. There's been a change in narrative for our bookshops. After a tough couple of decades, there seems to be a renewed interest in them, something they're noticing here at Mr Book's Bookshop in Tunbridge in Kent. I don't think physical books ever went away. I think some people who are really keen on books really keep buying books, and people who wanted to read during lockdown were desperate to buy books, to have real books. And I think a lot of people found more time to read as well and get away from the screen. I think that was a big part of it. Of course, it could have been a very different story, considering the impact the pandemic's had on our high streets. It has been a weird time, and it's fair to say the past 18 months have been a bit of a horror story for the retail sector. Lockdowns and other restrictions meant shops like this saw far fewer customers. But there is some light relief because during the pandemic, we've also seen a shift in people's reading habits and shopping habits. It seems many have turned over a new leaf and discovered a love of reading. More than 200 million paperbacks and hardbacks were sold in the UK last year, the highest sales for nearly a decade. There's also been a rise in the number of independent bookshops. The most recent figures from the end of last year show there are 967 shops nationally, up from 890 the year before. I think where people have had more time to read during lockdown, a lot of people have been reminded how much they enjoy reading and we're all thinking about our consumer choices a little bit more and wanting to invest in our communities and spend money on our high streets um, and support independent shops. There's plenty of support for this one, which only opened a few months ago. I think lockdown really sort of made me into a bigger reader than I already was. Never been a huge reader, but I've definitely been reading a little bit more than I used to. People have had enough of screens, really. I certainly have. And uh, with, with bookshops, you can just look and find things that you didn't know were there. And if you open your mind a bit, uh, you might even buy it and read it. The author, Dorothy Coombson from Brighton, hopes people will continue to support their local bookshops, warning it's a case of use them or lose them. I hope people don't think that just because we're talking about it now that it's fine and they can just let it go again. But I hope people continue to support them because it's good for authors, it's good for um, bookshops and also it's good for the economy. It does seem to be the start of a new chapter. And for an industry which has faced so many challenges, the current trends are something of a fairy tale. Lauren Hall, ITV News. Put that book down now, please, because you should be watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Coming up, Holly's here with the weather details. With many a crunchy leaf underfoot and a chill in the air, there's no mistaking we're well into November. But as we sink further into the month, temperatures are actually a little on the rise. I'll have your full forecast. And you can find more on today's top stories in the region throughout the day and evening on our website. Go to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Call us on this number 0808 1010 095. Follow us please on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, the COP26 Climate Change Conference has entered its second week and today the focus was on loss and damage and what we've already seen, sadly, such as the effects of severe weather and coastal erosion. Well, outside the conference, though, the protests have continued. At least 50,000 people marched in Glasgow at the weekend, demanding more action on the climate crisis, the biggest protest so far. Well, campaigner Greta Thunberg was there with organisers speaking to protesters, said leaders did not have the courage to lead, and it was up to them as citizens to have a voice. Many people from our region travelled there for the march. They haven't really taken on the urgency. If they'd really put in the urgency, I'd have more time for them. It's this age that's putting in the urgency because they're the ones going to be most affected. I just sort of can cry some days thinking of the grandchildren for when they're grown up and how it's going to be. And so we've got to get it right and we've got to, you know, try and stop this um, temperature rise and everything. 
Well, let's now cross to ITV political correspondent David Wood, who's at COP26 for us. David, lots going on today, including a speech from former US President Barack Obama. And we mentioned that today it was about the effects of climate change that we now see. Yes, that's right. And I think it means there's been a bit of a different feel to this summit today because, understandably, most of this summit has been about the future and about what governments across the world and also us as individuals can do to change our lifestyles to stop the planet warming up any further. But today's focus was to accept that the planet has warmed up and that's having an impact and causing global warming and that's having an impact on our lives. Freak weather events, for example, becoming more common. Uh, Newnham in Kent uh, recently experiencing flooding, something that scientists are warning will become yet more common and is something that we need to learn to live with. And other impacts of climate change we see in the Meridian region, well, our coastal lines are under threat too. Uh, Dover recently experiencing a number of cliff falls, so that's expected, expected to get more common. And some homes on the Isle of Sheppey, well, they are under threat too, should there be any more cliff falls there. So adapting to those changes and learning to live with them is the focus of today. And to try and get the message across, you mentioned Barack Obama's here, but another A-lister too, Meridian man Tim Peake, the astronaut uh, who's from just outside Chichester. Well, he's been here today trying to convince politicians and policymakers to make a real change. You have a fresh perspective of, of what planet Earth looks like from above. And here on Earth, it's very easy to look up on a sunny day and, you know, feel that the, the atmosphere goes on forever. And it doesn't. It's 16 kilometres thick. It's an incredibly thin atmosphere. And when you see that from space, it really brings it home how we need to look after it. And you see the impact of, of climate change, for example, wildfires and how that smog and smoke spreads through that very thin layer of the atmosphere. And, and it really, you know, hammers home that it's a very precious environment that we live Live in and we have to take care. So what exactly has been discussed here then? Well, one of the key issues has been fashion and the impact that that can have on the carbon footprint and on climate change. And one of the events has been focusing on making fashion more environmentally friendly. And it's something that's already being practiced right across the Meridian region. For example, one, someone from the Sussex University, well, they're recycling makeup as part of a project. And someone else from Deal, well, they're turning wetsuits into new fashion. So we sent the lovely Sarah Saunders to find out a lot more about them. I figured, what can I do myself that might make an impact? Eco entrepreneur Amina Begum takes makeup, which is past its sell by date or just unused, and transforms it into watercolour paint. And what started out as a Sussex University project has grown into an environmentally friendly business. All of these beautiful pigments and beautiful colours are literally just being thrown away because we don't know what to do with them. So that led me to discover that there was a much larger cosmetic waste problem at hand and I wanted to be able to help spread a message and tackle the waste in that cosmetics industry. We can make a big impact with small actions and show how we can work within a circular economy. And she's just been recognised with the Young Innovators Award for her plant-friendly paint. Turning the tide on waste in Deal, eco-designer Lorna Doyle is using wetsuits donated by the water sports community across the southeast coast and turning them into bags. I can't believe the amount of wetsuits that are thrown out. Um, it's just trying to collect as many as possible and transforming the material. I think my message is think before you buy something, um, look around you in your local community um, see what other people are making. And some of the materials that people do see as waste are quite interesting and you can create really amazing things out of them. These enterprising eco-businesses hope to show that even small changes can make a difference and provide an opportunity for an entrepreneurial spirit. Sarah Saunders, ITV News. Back to David at COP26 and David, time is running out with just a few days left at the conference. How much more to fit in? I think there is a lot more to fit in because we are really at the business end of this conference. So on the outskirts of rooms like this, hidden away from our cameras, are the negotiators and the climate change ministers from right around the world, desperately trying to dot the I's and cross the T's on agreements that were started off by the locusts of Joe Biden and Boris Johnson a week ago here in Glasgow. There is growing confidence, I understand, from government sources that agreements can be made here that will make a difference. But there's still a long way to go before all countries can agree on what that change should be.
David Wood, as always, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> now, the grandson of a war captain made an emotional journey to Sussex today. Ian Henderson laid a wreath to a soldier who died, having earlier saved his grandfather's life in the First World War. The ceremony at Brighton Station was part of a national Roots of Remembrance campaign backed by the Veterans Association and Southern Rail. James Dunham has our report. On we go. This train terminates at Brighton. This is my grandfather here with Manta Singh. But for Manta Singh, there wouldn't have been a, a generation of this branch of the Hendersons. That's because Subedar Manta Singh, or Sergeant Major, saved Ian's grandfather, Captain George Henderson. He was shot in the Battle of Neuve Chapelle on the Western Front in the First World War. There are various stories. Somebody said he enlisted the help of a wheelbarrow to get him back. Um, but he got him back and um, in a subsequent action, a month or two later, he was wounded. Sadly, Subedar Singh died from the injury in hospital in Brighton, having endured treacherous conditions. Here they were thousands of miles away. They'd come up from Marseille. They were actually committed into action with Indian um, drill, it wasn't winter clothing, they had the most appalling conditions. In the Second World War, Ian's father and Subedar Singh's son fought together. The bond between both families remains today. My son does a calendar every year. That is the two families, that's my son. This is oh, wow. At, that is at Chantry. What do you think we could all take from the story of your grandfather and, and Manta Singh? Well, I think it, it's of mutual respect and esteem. They looked after one another, and it's a, about, a, a, it, 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 it's a true appreciation of diversity. Ian's wreath is part of Roots of Remembrance, a campaign where wreaths are traveling by train across the country to honor the armed forces. The rail industry had a huge role to play in World War I and World War II, moving rations, equipment, and of course, troops whether they're healthy or injured around the country. Mantising himself probably came into Southampton and would be taken by train across to Brighton for his treatment. As his final destination, the wreath was laid. Ian, a symbol of how Subedar Singh's bravery continues to live on. James Dunham, ITV News. Such a lovely story. Mm. Now we're talking mushrooms. Mm. Holly has joined us now. When I've been walking the dolls, I must say, I've been seeing lots of very different and odd-looking mushrooms as well. And I just wonder, why, why is this, Holly? Well... I'm glad you asked. They do, <laughs> they do appear a lot more in autumn. It, it's the time of year. The, the earth is still very warm. It's getting moister. And that's just what fungus loves. So we start to see them all sprouting up all over the place. Because they are fun guys, aren't they? Oh, Fred, you're <laughs> a <laughs> fun guy. <laughs> How long did that one take you? Oh, you yeah, wish. <laughs> uh, but of course, I should just say, don't eat any of them. There no, are thousands no. of uh, types of fungus and very few in this country or in any country are uh, edible. So uh, yeah, just be very careful unless you really know what you're doing. Let's take a quick look. Okay. This first one, the classic, of course, it's the fly agaric. Oh, is the, one. the classic. Yeah, we see in fairy tales, don't we? Uh, now, a lot of, uh, a, lot of the or a lot of the fungus is actually under the ground. So the bit we see is only a tiny portion of it. Uh, you've got the mycelium under the ground, which can be thousands of metres long. Goodness really? me. Apparently, Goodness. yeah. Wow. Uh, now, this I've written, amethyst deceiver, or lilac fibre cap and that's because they look very similar one is edible one is poisonous so it just goes to show I don't well the um, <laughs> amethyst <laughs> seed is the edible lilac fibre cap is the poisonous so it just goes to show how careful you need to be yes. uh, Nicola sent in a yellow stag's horn Ooh. this is a jelly fungus it looks like coral, but it's slimy and gelatinous to the touch so I wouldn't go near it don't no, eat definitely. in fact don't eat any of them no, no that would that would no, be unless, you, unless you're a real expert yes <laughs> Not mushroom for the weather forecast, oh. but there is indeed just about enough room. Here she is, Holly Green. <laughs> Great Western Railway sponsors the ITV Meridian Weather. Well, the week hasn't started too badly. We've had a bit of brightness around for today and it's turning milder as well. That means the cloud will thicken and lower tonight. The air that's coming in is 
uh, more moist, so I think some hill fog around, some hot visibilities. But I think we should see some brightness for tomorrow. Temperatures will be that little bit higher than today, although equally it will be a bit breezier as well. Uh, then we've got a weather front approaching for Wednesday. That's going to bring a bit of patchy rain before clearing through. And then high pressure dominates for the tail end of the week, so I think that should settle things down. But we may see some problems with fog uh, at times out there at the moment then more cloud tending to thicken and as I say it will tend to lower as we push through tonight so sinking onto the hills giving a uh, hill fog some murky conditions a few showers running in as well and temperatures actually not falling that much from our daytime values so certainly a milder night than we saw last night into tomorrow morning then some poor visibilities to kick things off a murky grail to start a few showers around as well but hopefully brightening up relatively quickly so some sunshine emerging more of a breeze around than today a southwesterly but it is drawing in mild air so we're looking at temperatures for tomorrow getting up to around about 14 or 15 degrees which is a little on the high side for the time of year our times of high water hastings there 127 and again at 150 as you head into the afternoon and finally, the outlook. Well, I think some outbreaks of rain at times on Wednesday, thanks to that weather front. Uh, we do tend to find things brightening, though, I think, as we head towards the tail end of the week. There may be some problems with fog at times overnight, but as I say, some settled weather to be had by day. Great Western Railway sponsors the ITV Meridian Weather. Well, in just a moment, the ITV Evening News tonight with Mary Nightingale. I shall have our late news for you tonight about 10.33. Join me if you can. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thanks for watching. Enjoy your evening. Take care. Stay safe from us all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>